So we'll do what we did the uh, first session where we'll start with the Visio Divina, which is a um, kind of a, a visual prayer and devotion. And then we'll get on to the lecture. Okay, so the first week we went over early Christian Jesus up until before the Renaissance. <coughs> Last week we did early modern, so Renaissance and a couple hundred years around that. And now we're moving on to modern and contemporary Jesus. What's the first thing you think about in terms of Jesus and modern art as opposed to Jesus and Renaissance art? Red hair and blue eyes. Okay, so Anglo features, <laughs> okay. Warner, uh, Solomon. Warner Solomon. How about the fact that there's a lot less Jesus? I mean, in, in artwork, there's a lot less Jesus once you get into the Enlightenment period and beyond. There's this idea of um, a separation. And in the 20th century, there's what's called the... Uh, just lost my words. As soon as I started to say it, I lost them. Uh, the, uh, um, they're, they're absolutely gone. Terrible. But the idea is that as we get more and more modern, we become less religious. And so secularization theory of modernity is the term that just, I've been writing about it and I just lost it. Um, <laughs> this has nothing to do with it, but when you're writing stuff, I remember writing a big project before and I 
there was like a two or three word or letter word that looked wrong every time I wrote it. And it's the most annoying thing because like seven times in a day you check it and you're like, okay, it is right. But anyway, sometimes your mind just doesn't work the way it should. Okay, so, but with this secularization theory of modernity, the idea is that there's less and less religiosity as we become more modern. That hasn't um, proven to be true, but it has really affected the way that theorists and as a consequence also, consequence also artists have dealt with religious themes and you can't get much more of a religious theme than Jesus. So, You guys have probably all seen images kind of like this, right? So this is a, a sacred heart Jesus, but there are all sorts of kind of kitschy Jesuses that, because just because, you know, scholars and artists are saying, hey, we don't care about Jesus, doesn't mean people in their homes don't care about Jesus. And so they do still find different ways to have images of Jesus, whether or not they are within the broader art world. And so I just wanted to put that idea out. We're not going to talk a lot about this, but we will get some interaction with it. <clears throat> okay, so our beginning time period is the Enlightenment. And so here is a Jesus uh, painted by Benjamin West, who, well, this is an assumption piece. Benjamin West is an American painter who worked in England. And this is from what's called the neoclassical style. So, again, it's not an art history class, so I'm going to go into all the, the background. But neoclassical, it tends to be more kind of what we would tradi consider traditional looking. They tend to have very well articulated figures, uh, good rendering, good drawing, that, that sort of thing. This was commissioned by King George for the uh, Horns Court, which today we would call the Waterloo Chapel. Um, it was converted to a chapel during the renovations of Windsor Castle. Um, so in a, in a lot of ways, this looks a lot like the Jesus that we had seen throughout the Renaissance. He might be a, a little blonder, a little lighter, because we're further north. Um, West's plan for the chapel included 35 paintings, and these are big paintings. Um, it, it was a plan that grew from 18, and he was going to do basically all of human history, from the antediluvian all the way to um, end times. And so it was this massive project that never got finished because the king ended up getting sick, and this was very much tied to the Royal Commission. And I think he only finished, actually, I probably have it in my notes. You would think I would have that in my notes. Um, yeah, he, he completed 18 of the 35. Uh, ironically, <coughs> the largest collection of these in the world is Bob Jones University has seven of them. And so this is actually one that's at the, the Bob Jones University which my master's thesis was on their collection, and they actually have a fantastic collection, uh, somewhat ironically. Anybody know what this is? Okay, it's an execution. It's from an artist named Goya. Some of you have probably heard of Goya, Spanish artist. Yeah. So, so what, what's going on here? Yeah. So is there a Christ figure in here? The guy in the white shirt? Okay. So, but is he Jesus? So there's a Christ figure, but is he actually Jesus? Okay, so I put this in because it kind of underscores how religious imagery gets used in more modern periods. When we look at it, it definitely could be Jesus. There's actually, when you look closely, there's argue, people argue whether or not he has the stigmata or not. He's up in a sacrificial stance. The light is shining on him. Everybody else is scared, and he's... I mean, but 
it's actually not meant to be Jesus. He's a Spaniard who is getting about to get killed. And so what Goy is doing is he's using religious imagery to tell a different story because it's a language that, that people know. He's actually talking about kind of the, uh, <laughs> the... So with the Enlightenment, there was a ton of hope. And so you'll notice there's a church in the background. Is there any light in the church? Where's the only light here coming from? From the lantern, from this cube, from this rational shape. And so you have kind of this idea of enlightenment illuminating while religion isn't, but then it also doesn't lead to the wonderful place that we thought enlightenment was going to lead us. And so he's used, it's not an explicitly religious image, but I did want to point out that during this time, religious imagery starts to get transformed and used for more kind of secular messages, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, because there's been 1,500 years of Christian imagery at this point. That's the language that everybody is still able to see. And so, yeah, recontextualizing it to make a different statement. But also, there's a, a, a tradition during this time period with the French Salon of history paintings. And a history painting is the highest level of painting, but it's not history as necessarily as we think of it. Like Bible stories are history painting, mythology is history painting, but the history is history painting. But there's this sense, it's these images that are pulled from the past that have moral meaning and that sort of thing. So he's, in a more modern style, kind of employing those elements. All right, so we're moving to, that was early 19th century. We're mid 19th century here, 1864. This is at Edward Manet. Dead Christ with angels. And at the bottom, you can't see it here, but it actually has a reference to the biblical source, which is John 20, 12. And it says, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. Is that what this image shows? No. Did Manet just not know that he put Jesus in here? Why do you think he would do that, where he would have an image of Jesus, an obviously dead image of Jesus. He's, you know, he's pale, he's a little bit bluish, he's got the, the scars are, are visible, the angel is still in grief. Why would Manet put a, a visibly dead Jesus and then this reference, this Bible verse about Jesus being risen? You thought you were going to have easy questions today, right? <laughs> <coughs> he ran out of white paint. <laughs> That's why my students would do it. It's like, I can't afford another tube of white paint, so we'll do something completely different. Um, okay, so this is mid 19th century. You're having the influence of positive, uh, positivism, the scientific method, higher criticism. Everything is coming into the point of being able to be questioned. And essentially, he's questioning, maybe even denying, the resurrection in this image. And so this is a very different use of Jesus in an image, right? In Renaissance times, you never had somebody referencing a Bible verse and then denying the resurrection. So these last two images in particular are to kind of show the, the cultural changes that happened, particularly during the 19th century. Let's move on to early 20th century. This is Emile Nolde, the burial of Christ. He did quite a few religious images. He's a, a German expressionist, very religious, 
did a lot of Christian images. They weren't the, like the majority of his body of work, but there were quite a few of them. Is this like the Jesus images we've seen before? If not, how is it different? Yeah, he's not the strong, strapping Jesus who everybody looks up to. Kind of emaciated. What's that? Yeah, his, his, his color is not good. That, that, that is certainly true. To be fair, none of their colors are good. I mean, they're... Yeah, so this is expressionist painting. It's very emotional. It, um, you tend to show the brushstroke. In Renaissance times, you didn't show a lot of brushstroke. There's a sense of people can see the artist or feel the artist through the brushstroke, and so that's a, a, a big element of it. So it's rough. It's 1915. What's going on at that point? World War I, and he's German, so there's, it's kind of showing the darkness of the time. Very emotional, and it, just, it kind of reflects that despair that was in Europe in, in 1915. Who's the artist? Emil Nolde, N-O-L-D-E. What's that? No, he, he was Dutch-German, yeah. Now, he's, he's a, actually a, a religious painter in the 20th century, and there's not a lot of religious painters. Um, and he's also problematic, though. And I actually, last night, I looked at, pulled out the text that we teach from, and he's actually been removed from that text. Yeah, no, it's definitely crude, but that's not why he's been removed. That's, that was just, art historically, that was just the style. It's German Expressionism. It, this fits well within that, that genre of, of painting. The reason he's been removed is he lived until the 1950s. He was alive in Germany during the 1940s and late 1930s. His work, Hitler did not like his work, and so his work was um, in the uh, shows, my words have all gone today. Um, the, uh, starts with a D, oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, the work that Hitler didn't like that he got rid of, he, Nolde had a lot of his work in there. Um, but he was sympathetic to the Nazis. And, but so, like, right after the war, he and then later his foundation kind of positioned him of, like, look, we, we, uh, Hitler didn't like our work, or like my work, and uh, so it's okay to still like me. But over the last decade, there's been kind of a revitalization where the uh, foundation now has actually admitted, yeah, he was sympathetic to Nazism the whole time. And definitely there are anti-Semitic comments that he made, especially during World War I. And so it is interesting. He is, he, I didn't realize this until last night. He's no longer in the art history book that, that we use. Um, so he has kind of been removed fr from that. Um, he's still an important artist. But this is, I mean, just because you're a Christian, just because you... Uh, are doing biblical images doesn't mean sometimes you don't believe terrible things. So. Yeah, no, his his style definitely is very simple. Right, and Hitler did not like modern art at all, and so this was definitely a style that Hitler was not, yeah, did not like, and so. Um, Here is maybe the most famous uh, um, religious painter of the 20th century. So this is uh, George Henry Rualt. It's Christ and the Apostles. He's a French painter, painter um, identified with Fauvism and Expressionism. And that's kind of rare because there's not a lot of French Expressionists. This would be more of an Expressionistic style. So I think you can tell, you know, who Jesus is. And he's the is he's the one in the the middle. He was friends with Jacques Maritain, um, who was uh, kind of 
he was a theologian, but also wrote on aesthetics and that sort of thing. His focus, like, so this is Jesus. How does this representation of Jesus fare, or not fare, compare against any Renaissance representation of Jesus? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily look white, um, it, but it's crude or simple. It's not showing the particularity of Jesus. It's um, more focused on not, not be necessarily being a representation of who Christ is or was, but an expression of who he is. So it's a little bit different of a focus. It's more of a, a generalized idea about who Jesus is. He did a lot of biblical paintings and that sort of thing as well. Okay, we're going to step back to the late 19th century just for a second. This was 1937 to 38, just so you know. All right, this is another French painter, Leon Lermite. It's called The Friend of the Humble. It's 1892. A little more traditional in feel, right? Very, very different, right? Yeah, so <laughs> so So part, it's, uh, it's much more appealing to our senses. <laughs> Again, I'm being clear. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to go into you know which I think is a, a better artist or, or, or whatnot. So, so th th this is a this is a uh, um, from kind of the realism tradition, which actually realism was tied mostly to the 1840s, and so this is 1890s. So it's a little bit kind of behind what's trendy, but it has a, a real sense of space. It has a real sense of place, it has a sense of particularity. And this is, it's a fine painting, it's a good painting, but this painting in itself isn't really the reason I wanted to show you this painting. I wanted to show you this painting because of this painting. You probably all have seen this painting, right? So this is Warner Solomon, Head of Christ, 1941. He was an evangelical artist and illustrator. Why have you seen this image so much? Because it suits us, okay. Sunday school material. Because of your grandma's house. He was a good marketer. He was a good marketer. This is the most reproduced image of Jesus ever. Reproduced 500 million times. Yeah. And, and the YMC used, YMCA used to print them out and they would give them like the soldiers when they went, because it's 1941, we we're about to get into the war. And so that was a, a big part of it. It got tied in culturally at that point. Yeah. I mean, these, these were everywhere. Um, I mean, so Solomon, he was educated at the Art Institute in Chicago, but he also took um, classes at the Moody Bible Institute. And um, so he had kind of that more conservative evangelical focus on this. Um, he, his artwork, he said, was focused on bringing joy and happiness. And like I said, this was painted in 1941, but there was a first sketch for this was actually from 1924. And we do know he was familiar with this painting. He'd actually given a print of this painting as a gift, I think, to his mother. Yeah. So I was in touch with him last week. There was often emphasis about uh, having a halo or even using lighting, you know, whether it's exterior or some sort of thing that you to kind of substitute the halo. As we've gone through these, it seems like the ones that are more, I'm going to use long term because I'm not 
excuse me, but um, you know, realism based still do have that. That's in the one who's familiar with before, even that side of realism, and they have been a few more pieces and cycles and things, just flat lighting, there's no um, eminence or halo or anything like that. So when we see those differences, as we get into kind of modern and contemporary music <laughs> styles, is the halo more of a throwback to earlier styles and the black bit more taking for time, or is there just difference in the styles, or what is what kind of? A little bit of both. Yeah, um, so there's no direct halo here, but there is like this sense of light that uh, illuminates him. You have the same sort of thing here. He's being lit up by the window behind. Not so much in any of these or this one. You do have a sense of light coming from behind him. Right. Yeah, but again, for a different purpose, because he's not in any way the source of the illumination. Because with these other ones, there's always the sense of, yeah, we know it's the window, but yeah, it's also Jesus. What's that? Yeah, well, so it's meant to be Jesus. There's two, art historically, there's two traditions in terms of how we artists dress Jesus as when they paint him. One tradition is to dress him as if he's in the first century. Another tradition, and almost always Jesus is dressed that way. The other figures um, often are dressed as if they are contemporary or first century. And so, and we'll actually get to an artist who takes a different approach to that because he feels that either way, whether you're using 2,000 year old clothing or clothing from now, it ties the image to a particular time. And he thinks Jesus is kind of beyond time, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. All right, so like I said, most reproduced 500 million times. He's done other famous paintings. All told, he's been reproduced a billion times which is why when this goes up, you all know it. And that doesn't count like how many times he's on the internet even. So, um, yeah. He had, he had a professor uh, when he was studying at Moody who said, I hope sometime you give us uh, your conception of Christ. Uh, most of the pictures I have seen are too effeminate. I hope you'll uh, picture a virile, manly Jesus. And so this was part of what he was trying to do there. Ironically, one of the criticisms um, of this depiction of Jesus is that he's too effeminate and not virile and manly enough. And so it's, uh, when, you're, when you're going for the manly Jesus, you can never be manly enough, I guess. Um, Jesus for everybody. He's, he's manly with sensitivity. Right. And that's, and that's part of what Solomon was going for, is he did want that, that sensitivity, somebody that everybody could relate to. Um, in a lot of ways, this is both a nostalgic image. I mean, for us now, because it's 80 years old, but even when it came out, there was a nostalgia to it. It was tying to a type of imagery that wasn't prevalent anymore. But it also was contemporary, because you notice he's at this three-quarter pose. The background is kind of this simple background. It's not placed in a particular place like this one is. The lighting, it's kind of reminiscent of studio photography. And so it's this image that's both nostalgic and contemporary at the same time. It's also a, a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. So a very American conception of, of Jesus. Um, gets criticized a lot for a variety of different reasons, but it's a, an important image. It is, like I said, the most recognized image of Jesus for Americans. This is an image more than anything else that's determined how we picture Jesus in our head. Anybody know this one? Dolly. Dolly. Okay, so we've got Salvador Dolly. This is a Christ of St. John on the cross, 1951. So you've got Christ on the cross in this kind of odd position. There's no nails, there's no crown of thorns, there's no blood. Dolly felt that those would kind of mar the image. She actually had a dream about that. Um, if you notice, there's kind of a triangle in the way it's set up, and then a circle in the middle. 
and those are shapes that for him were very important. Um, it, he actually saw this as representing a nucleus of an atom or our very unity with the universe. And so again, this is a, another image that's taking Christian imagery. Dolly said that he is a Catholic without faith. He, his, his mother was a devout Catholic. He met with the Pope and all that, but did not consider him a per, himself a person of faith at all. But he was using, again, Christian imagery to try to give, deal with different, slightly different ideas. Not well critically received by 1951. It was not cool for artists to, to make images of Jesus, especially artists who were already well known at this point. Now this Jesus is a little different. This is from 1962. What is different about this Jesus? He's skeletal, okay, so you can see the, the, the bones. We've seen some from the medieval period, especially, that are like that, or um, Wiesenheim altarpieces like that. But there's a lot of you know, much more muscular uh, Jesuses. He's got a loincloth. He's got a loincloth, so he's not completely nude, but that's not completely unusual. There's one big difference. He's black. Yeah, the, the title is The Black Christ. 1962, this is actually by a South African artist during apartheid. Oh, he's a wee little bit, yeah. Um, yeah, he actually uh, put the, so Albert Luthuli, who is the president of the African National Congress, is who he modeled this Jesus after. So it was very political. Um, you can also imagine during apartheid South Africa, not well received. No. Um, the, the powers that be were not happy to have a black Jesus being shown. Um, so it's Ronald Harrison as the artist. It was actually, the painting early on was smuggled out of South Africa because People wanted to destroy it and that sort of thing. It didn't return to South Africa. Again, it was painted in 62. It didn't return until 1997. So it was out of the country for a long, long time. Even in 2007, there was a proposal to permanently exhibit the painting, and that still resulted in public outcry. And so this idea of a black Jesus, especially in South Africa, but in America too, is a controversial idea. Okay. And, and the AAC, the Congress, I mean, the government was very heavily invested in trying to just, just obliterate them because, you know, they wanted to retain the power and didn't want to share the power with, right. you know, the, with the black people. That's, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. And so even today, this is a, a controversial piece, less so than it was, obviously, but. This is interesting though. This is a Roman mosaic from 520. So going back into history, there, there is debate about whether it's really a black Jesus or not, but it certainly presents that way. And the idea of a black Jesus has become something that a lot of people cling on to. So you have entire websites devoted to kind of these kitschy versions of a black Jesus. All right. Now let's get even more controversial. Does anybody know this image? It's from 1987, back when the National Endowment of the Arts used to still fund individual artists. <coughs> It's a photograph by Andre Serrano entitled Piss Christ. It is a photo of a crucifix in a vat of urine. 
So we remember the outcry of that was pretty, pretty huge. It was a, a Baptist minister in um, Alabama was the one that kind of started the, the big outcry about it. And as I think you can imagine, the Catholic Church in particular was not really thrilled with it, but evangelicals weren't happy with it. A bunch of people were not happy with this. Why? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can't put Jesus in a, a vat of urine. And there's something that seems sacrilegious about that, right? But Serrano is actually a lifelong Christian. He was raised in the Catholic Church. He's not Catholic anymore. But, and he did go through a period where he kind of, kind of walked away. But it's a... Interesting in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. One, of the, one critic said that this piece explores how spiritual belief has been exploited and spiritual values debased. So there's an element of this of Serrano critiquing the church. Serrano himself said that what it symbolizes is the way Christ died. The blood came out of him, but so did... The urine and the feces, I'm changing his words there. Um, maybe if piss Christ upsets you, it's because it gives you some sense of what the crucifixion actually was like. And there is an element of that, you'll see in some other artwork as well, that we do, when we see Jesus on the cross, we really kind of want him to be sanitized and kind of comfortable. <laughs> we don't like the, a debased, vulgar depiction of Jesus. But the crucifixion was pretty debased and vulgar. And so, um, I mean, as a photograph, it's a, it's a beautiful photograph. The imagery itself is controversial. And I think people of good intent can fall on both sides of whether they think it's appropriate or not. It definitely asks questions that we find uncomfortable. But that's part of what is going on with modern art in general is it's pushing boundaries, it's asking questions. All right, so you looked at this one for three minutes earlier. It's, it's a shaped canvas. I need to fill in the white there with black just so you, it's more clear. It's huge. It's 16 by 11. So it's a, a very large painting by Edward Nippers. It's called The Sacrifice. He was raised Nazarene, and he's now Episcopalian. He went to Asbury College and got his uh, Master's of Fine Arts at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, which I only say because we're close to it. If I was doing this in California, I probably wouldn't say that. But, um, it's, it's a cross shape. It's a, a shaped canvas. Yeah, yeah, the, I need to, yeah, I need to fill the white in with black so it's clear. But yeah, it's, it's a cross shaped canvas. In 1983, Nippers began, ex well, I should point out real quick also. This is 1986, this is 1987, and they're both dealing with this issue in very different ways, but they're both dealing with this issue of kind of the violence of the cross. Uh, it, my mind just went crazy. It <laughs> looks like an anatomy drawing of a circular system, or circular quarry system, with all the blood and the <clears throat> Yeah. No, there, there's an element to it. There's, there's a really visceral feel to it. I mean, you look at the coloration in here, it shows the bruising and the blood, and it's, it's violent. Yeah, you've got a little bit. Heaven's usually our source of illumination or source of like heaven and God. Mm -hmm. so here, the heavens are dark and the earth is dark. Yeah. Maybe you could say it's not forsaken, but also it's just a reverse of what Jesus Christ seems to have done. Right. It does still have a little bit of light up. I mean, he is a yeah, devoted yeah. Christian artist. So it's, it's different than Dolly, who's saying, I'm a Catholic, but I don't believe in God. Um, right. And, but all he, he was early in his career, again, in 1983, he started doing exclusively biblical images. All his biblical images are nude. Because what we were talking about with the clothing earlier, he feels that the incarnation is what unites us all, and that our, our physical bodies are what unite us. 
And if you show the biblical stories in clothing from 2,000 years ago, that separates us from it because we don't dress like that. But if we put it in contemporary clothing, that separates them from the stories. The one thing, no matter what clothing you're wearing, the one thing that's the same is the body. And so that's an integral part of the statement that he's trying to make. He's trying to avoid all the kind of cultural trappings that tie an image to a particular time. And so he's trying to make it so that these are images that are never anachronistic. So this image, again, very large, 16 feet tall, was at one point hung in his church. And some people loved it, and some people really did not. Some people very strongly reacted against it. One lady who wrote a letter to his rector complaining about it, but also in there made an interesting statement about how, even though she really did not like the image, that it did make her have the kind of this image of baby Jesus, because it was shown around Easter, this image of baby Jesus that she had in her head, it made her allow Jesus to grow up, which was, was kind of interesting. One of my favorite stories about this is he talks about his godchildren. And his uh, friend was trying to teach his, God, his children about the, the Easter story, about the crucifixion, about the resurrection, all those sort of things. And the kids just weren't getting it. And he was using all these Sunday school images, what Nippers calls these uh, semi-heretical <laughs> Sunday school images, because they're so kind of cleaned up. And um, the kids just could not understand why Easter was a big deal. And then at one point, his friend remembered, oh, I've got a catalog that has this image in it. And he went and he got that catalog and he showed it to his kids. And his kid's like, oh, he actually died. Which I thought was really interesting that the way we depict the crucifixion, the way we depict all these sort of things can really affect... Uh, our understanding of it. Yeah. It's interesting to me that the, the letter and complaint of this because of the nature of the image of the picture parallels a lot of complaints from the homeless Jesus bench action mm -hmm. that people, uh, you know, there's uh, a man who's back in the book, the only thing that lets you know that it is Jesus is that you see the nail uh, and runs at his feet on the bench and it was put outside of several churches. Set people were because in this depiction of Jesus in their nice upper middle class neighborhood kind of thing, and that, that sanitization of the image yeah. uh, who we want to see Jesus as, uh, it leads to it forcing me to confront <coughs> truth uh, rather than a sanitized image. Right. We, we want an Easter story that only makes us feel happy. We don't want an Easter story that also makes us incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> And the Easter story should break us, but also give hope. And we, we just want the, we want, we want the cap, cotton candy without the substance. Yeah, it, it bows. Yeah, so it's showing the way. It's really kind of... I think he does it to show the, the physical weight of it. His work during this time period is there's not a lot of sense of transcendence. Like there, there's no like angels, glorified angels or, or that sort of thing. Um, it's a, a very grounded in the incarnation artwork. Now that does change actually um, after his wife passes away. He starts thinking about beyond the veil a little bit more after his wife passes away. And he does start, so here you have Christ in the wilderness, and you see the angels ministering to him through kind of this abstract cubist space. And so this sort of imagery, you can see the devil over here, this sort of imagery becomes for him a metaphor for the veil between the spiritual and the physical. And so he does start bringing that sort of element in a lot more 
after his wife passes away. Before that, it's not so, not so much. These are all, I should say, these are also huge. This is 8 foot by 12 foot. So these are very, very large canvases. They've, they've been controversial. They're, they're way too Christian for most museums. But also, he, he displayed work at Covenant College, and it got attacked and cut. And so he, he has been controversial because the secular world's not comfortable with it, and oftentimes the Christian world is not comfortable with it. Yeah, so part of what's happening is you see kind of this cubist forms around here that kind of break it up. So you can see it, yeah, and this is actually the angel's hand here. Yeah. And so the angel's hand is going on there. So it's like he's being supported and lifted up by the angel, the hand underneath, and then the hand coming around here. And so he's in kind of an awkward position because this is Jesus when he was at, a, at his lowest point pre-passion. You guys know who this is by? Thomas Kincaid. Okay, the, the highest selling artist in general over the last uh, few decades. Um, the artist that artists and art critics love to hate. Um, so he, a openly evangelical Christian who signed uh, all his images with John 3.16, embedded all sorts of little clues in there. He did these, these happy cottage images that you guys have probably seen. Um, also had a very tragic life. When he died, he was actually having an affair. He's famous for urinating off of a balcony at um, Disneyland. I mean, definitely two sides to, to this artist. Um, He didn't, there is an early image of Christ, but most of what he does is an empty cross. Which, and I, I grew up Baptist, we always talk about we do an empty cross because Christ is risen, yada yada. But I think Kincaid did it for a little bit of a different reason, I'll get into it in just a second. I do want to show that this isn't just coming out of his Head. He does have art historical references, so we have Caspar David Friedrich here, who did have Jesus on the cross. But so the, the, he does actually reference art history in his work a lot more than we uh, tend to think. He makes it a lot more cotton candy than Friedrich did. Here's another image which references Friedrich, but also references the Hudson Valley School and, and that sort of thing. Um, again, the, the empty cross. Which for a lot of evangelicals, yeah, is you know Christ is risen. But Kincaid, here's the other image of Jesus I'll show. And you'll notice in none of these, Jesus is it's like an illusion of Jesus. It's not like he's either not there or not in much detail. This is called the uh, the walk of faith. Um, so he's walking with Peter in a garden. But Kincaid was intentionally painting as if there were no fall. which I have a problem with theologically. But it also means that maybe that idea, whoops, going the wrong way, that idea of the empty cross has a different connotation if you're intentionally painting as if there were no fall. So he's trying to imagine a world that was never invaded by sin. But it also means it's a world that never needed Christ. And then he paints empty crosses. This is actually, I think, at the, one of the Billy Graham facilities in North Carolina. I don't think Billy Graham's people thought about that aspect when they had him paint that. But All right, this is Emmanuel Garibay, Manny Garibay. This is called Oblation. And I'll try to go fast because we're running out of time. Um, is this Jesus? So he's got the stigmata, he's got the wounds. What's he missing? He's missing the cross, the crown of thorns. From an American perspective, he's missing the whiteness. He's an Asian Jesus. Garibay's a Filipino artist. And, so, and it's not 
titled, you know, the Christ or anything like that. That is called the oblation, which is something that Christ did, but also something that we can do. Um, and so what Garibe plays with is, and I do think this is meant to be Jesus, but he tends to paint Jesus also as the everyman. So this definitely could be Jesus, but it also could just be any other Filipino person. It's, I'm wonderfully emotional and emphatic. It's, size-wise, it's maybe a, a little bigger than this, but not too much. Here's a, another image he did. On a bus, but yeah. So he's a Filipino artist. What do you guys, do you guys know anything religiously about the Philippines? Huge Catholic influence. And Garibay in particular has some hard feelings about some of the things that have happened in the Philippine, Philippines because of that Catholic influence. So he does tend to paint a lot of priests with long noses. You have a Jesus type figure who again could be every man, but who has no mouth. And who nobody these religious figures aren't paying attention to. So he's definitely putting some common <laughs> commentary into these images that are both referencing Jesus, but not explicitly Jesus. This one gets a little more controversial. This is the uh, Supper at Emmaus. Is there a Jesus in here? The woman in the red dress has the stigmata. So this is, again, separate Emmaus, she, as Jesus is there, you know, having a good time with these guys, she's also wearing a red dress. I, Would, I, didn't <laughs> I didn't know you were a woman, Jesus. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. Um, but also the red dress references that maybe she is a woman of ill repute. And so there, he intentionally pushes a lot of these boundaries and makes a, a lot of people uncomfortable because of it. This is one, one's a little different. So this one is more clearly a Jesus figure, whereas the others are kind of Jesus and every man, you know, the Magadei in us maybe. This is called the reunion. What's going on here? Sort of. I mean, it definitely is designed to reference the Last Supper, right? You've got the the 12 religious people around him. What's their attitude towards him, though? Yeah, it's kind of scorn. They're, they're, yeah, so you've got Jesus. He's you know, sacrificing himself. It definitely is referencing the Last Supper. But this is not like that iconic Da Vinci meal. <laughs> I mean, it is a, a very different feel. The, there's this religious reuniting. Um, many years afterwards where they're kind of scornful of the, uh, the source of that. Not connected to the community of disciples that we're accustomed to seeing in like the Last Supper. I mean, it's a very different feel. So Gerbe, who's a Protestant, obviously has some issues with the Catholicism as it manifests in uh, the Philippines. Um, so a lot of his work deals with, with those issues. What's that? The clothing looks like sort of cross time too. Yeah. Well, well, these are all in ecclesial dress or wearing a neck. Actually, it's not even a necktie. It's his hands. He's praying, oh. praying, but not caring about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. These are devoutly, openly religious people who could care less about Jesus. Is I don't think he's meant to be in clown makeup. I think it's just the, the red on the projector shows a little more. It might even be a little more red, but um, I don't think it's meant to be a clown. Although Ruault did do clowns um, before he started doing religious imagery, and, and they were meant to kind of have a moral tone. So it's a possibility it's a reference there, but I, I don't think so. This is pretty recent. Um, I, don't, I don't have the date written down on this. 
This one was 2008. This one was 97. This one is, I think, early 2000s. All right, so here's a piece from 1879, just showing Jesus as the um, rich young ruler, just to show that there is a history of showing Jesus as a different ethnicity. And that's something that has become more and more important. This is He Chi, who is a well-known Chinese artist now, who depicts Jesus in a way that is recognizable and identifiable to his Chinese audience. This is a Thai artist who does the same thing, uses traditional Thai language, a visual language. An actually interesting quote from her. She says, my work represents influences from many styles. I believe, I believe Jesus Christ is present in every culture, and I have chosen to celebrate his presence in our lives through Thai traditional cultural forms. My belief is that Jesus did not choose just one people to hear his word, but chose to make his home in every human heart. And just as his word may be spoken in every language, so the visual message can be shared in the beauty of the many styles of artistry around the world. And so a lot of these artists are very explicitly creating a Jesus that their audience can relate to. Here's another artist, Noma Desarne from Indonesia. He lives in Bali. Um, and this is the Book of Revelation. So you can see Jesus down here as a, as a warrior. But this is tied very closely to traditional Balinese painting. Jesus is also more recently been shown as a woman. This is a sculpture called Krista that was shown first in 1984 at St. John Divine in New York. There was a, a big cry about it and um, it ended up being taken down. Gender norms and that sort of thing, the politics around that have changed over the last uh, few decades and so this was exhibited again in 2016 and 2017 at St. John Divine, along with several other images. So there is a history, especially within modern art, but it does go back past that, of showing Jesus in different ethnicities, Jesus in different genders, trying to make a Jesus that, that everyone can relate to. All right, so we are at the end of our time. I did have a, a couple of images. I'll skip past. I had a couple of just, Mormonism has been very influential to the way Jesus is depicted in America. This is actually a Seventh-day Adventist artist who um, was commissioned by the Mormon church, but it's a well-known image. Um, people, probably a lot of people have seen this image, a lot of evangelicals and other Christians buy that image as well. Although you can see for Mormons, their, their, uh, their belief about God is a little different. So you have God the Father and Jesus both present at the first vision. Um, McNaughton showing kind of, this is a very political Jesus that has been influential in a lot of circles as well. This is a more contemporary and I'll, I'll again, we're out of time so I don't wanna to spend too much time in it. This is from, I think, 1999. Um, it's a, a homo eke. So behold the man when, when Pilate was presenting Jesus to the masses. But it shows him in a, a way that I think is really powerful that references classical sculpture, but at the same time is contemporary. And for me, it shows a Jesus that is, crosses time. And this is the big mural at Biola University, which is very well known. It's, I think 30 feet tall, it's a, called The Word, and it's you know, very evangelical in its orientation, Jesus holding a, a Bible. So that's kind of our, our run through of contemporary images of Jesus. They, there's a, a lot of different ways that, that artists go from you know, denying the resurrection to completely supporting it. I mean, contemporary art and modern art has a, a complicated relationship with Jesus. <laughs> and that's it, thank you.